Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone to this EGU debate. In past years, these debates often have a question, and I suppose if, the, if, there, if that was to be done this year, the question would be something like, does Europe have a, a minerals crisis? But if you notice the way the question's been phrased today, it's been phrased such as to give an answer. Clearly, there is a general perception that Europe does have at least a serious minerals issue, if not a minerals crisis. The continent imports about 95% of the minerals it uses, and uh, a lot of attention, I think, was focused not only European mines, but US mines and so on by uh, China's uh, decision um, a year or so ago to restrict access to its, uh, some of its rare earth metals. European politicians appear to have a vision of the way they want this continent to, to, to go in terms of energy and technology. And if you came back here in 20 or 30 years' time, that vision might see, for example, wind turbines perhaps on top of this very building, powering it. You might see, have electric cars going down the streets outside. Well, all those things have to be made of something. And, and the question is, I think, is there currently a secure enough supply of minerals coming into Europe to build that sort of uh, future that politicians apparently want to have here, but supplies of some rather more fundamental things and things like rare earth elements are also an issue. I remember being in Liberia a few years ago and wondering where all the telegraph wires had gone and they were being cut down and sold because the price of copper was so high that it became economically viable to shin up telegraph poles, cut down the copper wire and go and sell it. So there we are. Uh, I'm Richard Black, by the way. I'm generally a BBC journalist, but for the next hour and a half, uh, it's my pleasure to try and keep these five fine gentlemen uh, in order as they give you their wisdom and indeed then answer some questions and points that, uh, that you may have. So uh, from the left, I'd like to introduce Louis von Borte from the University of Geneva, who's also president of the Society of Economic Geologists. I had to, I've not heard of that institution before, Louis. It's great to know that it uh, that exists. Uh, Patrick Redmond is uh, is is from the, from the from the corporate sector, but that's okay. He's uh, he, he works he works with the tech uh, tech company and uh, looks after exploration in, uh, in 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 Europe. Richard Harrington is like me from London, from the Museum of uh, Natural History, and is a researcher in economic. Mineralogy, another discipline I didn't know existed till today, so that's fantastic. Um, Paul Ancier uh, is from the European Commission in the Metals, Metals Minerals and Raw Materials uh, Division, and uh, last in my little list here, but about to be first to speak, is uh, Patrice Chrisman, who's head of uh, BRGM, uh, the uh, Division of Mineral Resources. This is Public Service Research Institute in France, looks after minerals mining and such and such. So the way this is going to work, all of these uh, gentlemen are going to speak for sort of uh, seven or eight minutes or so, and then we're going to have a chance, going to throw it over to you, what questions you want to ask, what points you want to put, and then finally we'll have a little bit of roundup from, from the chaps on the panel. So Patrice, would you like to come and uh, your eight minutes starts here. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to touch, address three points. So the first point is about the future, what can we say, uh, what can we think about the future mineral resource demand, and what are the major related challenges. Let me take the example of iron ore, because iron ore makes up in tonnage 80% of all the total produced mineral uh, tonnage across the world, and iron makes steel, and steel is an infrastructure metal. You need a lot of steel when you start developing your economy, railroads, and so on. Um, so uh, here you have a graph uh, taken from USGS data. Thank you, USGS, for doing this wonderful work for all of us. Um, uh, since the beginning of the 20th century, and then you have an extrapolation of what could be the production in the next years up to 2050, taking just a very modest 3% average uh, growth of uh, iron ore production. And that is a very modest uh, forecast, because over the last 10 years, the uh, 
uh, average gross rate of iron ore production was rather in the range of 7% due to the very rapid ex expansion of the Chinese economy. Here the story behind that chart is that within the next 40 years, from 2010 to 2050, humanity will have to produce more minerals of all sorts, iron being just one, than it has been produced probably since the origin of humanity in 2010. So that is an absolutely major, I would say, dramatic challenge because it means not only will we have to discover those minerals, we'll have to produce them, we have to produce the energy needed to produce these minerals, we have to take care of the environment. So this is an absolutely baffling uh, challenge for all the humanity. And the way we are going to address this challenge at a global scale may mean a lot of war or, uh, to the contrary, a lot of progress and peace on Earth. Here is another foresight by Rio Tinto about copper, uh, aluminium, and iron again uh, up to 2030. And here, the, to keep the long story short, is just to, tell, to say that we, in average, uh, the industry, the geological surveys, will have to discover one Pilbara iron ore system and put it into production every five years, and one La Escondida, which is the world's largest porphyry copper, to my knowledge, every year uh, to satisfy the forecast demand in minerals. And that is despite the progress, of course, we can make in recycling, reuse, and reduction of consumption. But these recycling, reuse, and reduction will not be enough uh, to meet the demand of a rapidly growing world population. We still have to grow from 7 to 9 billion within the next, uh, say, few tens of years, up to 2050. I would like to say a specific word about the location of the reserves of many of these uh, minerals and metals. Many of them are located in developing countries, in emerging economies, with, which have a gross national income of less than eight euros per day and per capita. How do you believe that these countries can finance the institutions, the geological surveys, the environmental directorates, all those institutions, how can they uh, develop regulations and implement those regulations needed to have a proper mining industry there and which will perform according to sustainability criteria. This is out of the world. That is why cooperation from the richer countries which have funds but also technological knowledge is of extreme importance. The second point I'm going to address very briefly because these are all very complex topics. Uh, is the world going to run short of mineral resources? So uh, there is absolutely no lack of evidence to the contrary of petrol, of hydrocarbons, that we have something like peak copper or peak zinc or peak whatever metallic substances. Geologically, we just touched the few hundred meters uh, below the surface in Europe, for instance, which has a very old history of mining. We didn't go very deep with mining in Europe, uh, so we still have a lot of minerals and metals under our feet which remain, which are there to be found, discovered and exploited. But the issue is about accessibility to these resources. So it's not availability, the issue, to my opinion, but it's accessibility. So we have issues related to poor governance in many resource-rich countries. Uh, uh, several African countries and so on. Uh, they have civil wars, they have very poor regulatory frameworks. So it's a very big issue uh, to invest in minerals. You have to know that in average, uh, large-scale metallic uh, deposits require investments in the range of several hundreds of millions of dollars or uh, even sometimes billions. Resources nationalism is developing rapidly. Uh, we have uh, poor regulatory frameworks. We have poor geological knowledge base. Even in Europe, geological surveys have been systematically underfunded for the last 30 years, and our knowledge, including in my own country, France, is not in the best condition. In Europe, in the rich countries in the Western world, where there's a problem about the social license to mine, uh, because uh, we have the NIMBY syndrome, not in my backyard, not in my lifestyle, not in my election year. Uh, so it's a big issue to open new mines in rich countries. 
Then, over the last years, we had the rapid development of exchange-traded commodities, speculative funds based on uh, metals and minerals, and they add much volatility uh, to the markets, which is another problem than energy and water shortage. So the list of issues that uh, hinder access to minerals is very long. A few words about critical minerals, regional factors, political and social issues. Here, critical minerals are minerals that are of great importance to the economy of a region, of a country, and so on. And also minerals uh, for which there are risks of undersupply. Here is a list of critical minerals uh, for the energy sector with all their applications. I believe that these slides will be made available to you. I won't, don't want to comment them, but all the green technologies we dream about, windmills, green cars, photovoltaics, they all require sometimes very rare uh, minerals and metals. Now here, the respective role of state and uh, private sector. Uh, the future of raw material supply depends on the capacity to develop genuine partnership between governments and the private industry in a, a private uh, a public partnership uh, spirit, because it's up to the state to develop the database, the knowledge base on geology. It's up to the state to develop the proper regulation, the regulatory framework, and to implement it and monitor its implementation. But it's up to the private sector, of course, to invest, explore, and develop mines. Here are the various steps to develop a mine. Again, I will keep the long story short. Uh, it takes between 10 to 20 years between you have a geological idea and you eventually open a new productive mines, and it takes a huge investment. So you have the data on the figure. My last slide will be about price volatility. That is to show you uh, a, uh, an extract from a presentation from Bloomsbury Minerals Economics showing their modeling of what is the fundamental copper price, that's the red line, and what is the effect, in their opinion, of uh, all these derivative markets uh, like these uh, ETCs, ETFs I earlier mentioned that developed very rapidly till, uh, to, uh, since 2005, sorry. So you see that the added volatility here on copper prices is absolutely extreme and it makes it very difficult nowadays for mining companies to develop uh, feasibility studies because you don't know what copper price, for instance, you should consider for your, as a reference for your future investment. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Patrice. So your last slide showing there we've got something else to blame the bankers for. Good news. Um, maybe people before this whole China story blew up a year ago wouldn't perhaps have known where uh, rare earth elements um, came from. I think after the next eight minutes we might know a bit more about where all these things come from. Louis Fudbote. Uh, good afternoon. I would like to put a little bit also, start to put, my colleagues will develop on that, and also in small European perspective on that, and stress that we would need to, independent of, we are dependent or not dependent on outside mineral resources, we need to put a strong know-how, research, and education, education uh, points here in Europe to understand what is happening. Why that? It's clear that demand will explo is exploding, not only for iron, but also for the other elements. And we need to understand really what the situation. In this uh, journal, Mining and Environmental Management Journal, two years ago, it was published this clock, saying that zinc would be exhausted in 17 years from now, and copper in 32 years from now. Is correct? Is wrong? Of course, it's absolutely wrong. It's bullshit. <laughs> but this is actually a, a revival of another debate we had 30 years ago, or more now, 40 years ago, with the provisions of the Club of Rome, which were very interesting, very useful, but on metals, they were not on the right path. They were saying that uh, some met metals would be exhausted by 2000 and the rest by 2050. Of course, we know that is not the case. Why these provisions were wrong? 
why this public perception is often so wrong. And this is important that we understand it's wrong because there are problems in the raw materials and raw minerals in the mineral sector, but we have to distinguish where the real problems are and not what the false problems are. The question is that <coughs> to measure an ore to, be, to build a reserve figure, we have to invest. And the companies only make the necessary investments to assure the operation, and not more, not longer. If they have a big mine, like a big La Escondida mine, two billion in business uh, investment, they will assure reserves for 40 years, perhaps 50 years. If they are mining a small gold mine at the surface with five, uh, uh, reserves for five years, that's enough. They will recover the investment. So the figures that you find in the US uh, service are actually this kind of reserves where companies have invested and have, have nothing to do, when they are talking about reserves, nothing to do with the geological reserves. You can see here in this, uh, in this table what did happen with the lifetime of copper, for example, reserves of copper. In 1969, uh, the, uh, the, the lifetime for, for copper was five, uh, 51 years, which is normal for big mines. Because of the incentives of the following the report of Club of Rome, the uh, governments gave money. The reserves, the companies invest, invested a lot in exploration. Reserves increase until 72 years for copper or 40 years for zinc, which is actually very, very high. Usually for zinc is around 20 years. This was a disaster because the prices collapsed. Developing countries were selling their products much, much cheaper. Geologists were, of course, fired. The, no, there was no more exploration. The result, you see that in 2001, when the Ch China and, the, and India started to consume a lot of raw materials, companies had not invested because it was not worth to. So suddenly, copper reserves had, were down to 27 years, which was too short. And this explains, in part, the increase in prices now. Zinc, in between, had been where again at 20 years, what is the normal thing for uh, uh, zinc mines. Now we are 30, 40 years for copper, 20 years for uh, zinc, which is in normal figures. Does it mean that uh, we can continue business as usual? Actually not. We have quite main challenges in front of us. The demand will double or more, probably much more than double in the next years. The discovery rate is declining. For this, there are several reasons. There is less space open for exploration. Patrice has explained some of the reasons, mainly is environmental impact, social acceptance, regulations, political <coughs> unrest. We are exploring more mature districts. The structure of the business most exploration is still near surface. It's not like oil. We are really scratching the surface. It's a cyclic business. It's difficult for companies to keep corporate know-how know -how and memory. The public sector has com had completely retreated from the sector because the prices were so low for other reasons. It was too easy to buy metals just somewhere. Lack of innovation. Most geological departments in the Western world do not teach or make research in economic geology. Environmental impact, social acceptance is a big question because they are real problems and sometimes they are not solved well. Many projects have been stopped because of that. On the right si side, you see now in Switzerland, there is a big campaign uh, saying raw materials of Africa feed our consumption des desires but not hunger in Africa, which probably in large part, to large extent, is correct. This is a problem there, and that, of course, m raw materials and mining se the mining sector is, is difficult for them to put new mines and new projects. We need to change that. When, when I'm saying that the declining, the, uh, the discovery is declining, you see the, here, for example, in this graph that 
in this moment, we are expend, uh, investing a lot in exploration, but actually the, exploration, the discovery rate for several metals actually is not increasing, and we should be doubling that because of uh, the demand of Asia in China and so on. So we will have to have a lot of exploration the next years. That is good news for the students in this room. They would like to work in this sector. We have to remember that it's still a lot of, most of the exploration is near surface. For example, here for gold deposits, most gold deposits in the Western world have been found above 200 uh, uh, meters depth. In the developing countries, is even more close to surface. The future. Of course, we will go ahead to more technical exploration, undercover exploration. We need more, better, better models. We need better geological knowledge, new geochemical, geophysical tools. We need more science. We need to minimize and include the cost of social disruption, of environmental impact. And we need, it's a very essential, this is the main, main message here. We need more education and research on the integrated vertical raw materials chain, also in Europe. Even if perhaps we don't have so many mines, perhaps we have more than we think, or more potential than we think, we will hear about that. But independently of that, we need to know about raw materials because we depend on them. That means, that means opportunity for research and teaching. We need the companies should perhaps change the way of working to have a better corporate, corporate continuity. We need implication of the public sector. We will hear more about that. More about that. And we need also a better informed public opinion and to help distinguishing where are the real and the false problems. We have problems, but perhaps not that the people often think. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Luis. Now, in Europe, luckily, we have the European Commission actually working on this very issue at the moment and, and devising, well, I think, first of all, uh, ways to describe the problem and then to solve it. And uh, Paul Ancien from the European Commission uh, is working on that very initiative. So, Paul. Thank you. I think uh, Patrice already mentioned in his presentation that there are indeed uh, some serious challenges regarding commodity markets, in particularly uh, speculation. And the Commission has been working on this, uh, announcing a number of measures to increase the transparency in the functioning of, for instance, the commodity derivatives markets. But in my presentation, I want to focus in particularly on the challenges related to raw materials. And as we've seen from previous pre presentations, we expect that demand for raw materials will continue to grow and particularly driven by the growth of emerging economies like China, uh, Brazil, for instance. But also, demand is increasingly being impacted by new technologies, many of them uh, green technologies. In the EU, we have to import a lot of raw materials, and we have to procure them on the global markets where we see a lot of uh, distortions. On the other hand, where we do have a potential in Europe, we're facing a highly regulated environment and uh, a competition with many other land users. The Commission's uh, raw materials strategy is called the Raw Materials Initiative, launched in 2008 and recently reinforced with a new policy document. And it tries to continue to build on three pillars. Uh, the first one, uh, ensuring a fair and sustainable supply to raw materials in global markets. The second one is about our domestic supply, and the third one is about uh, recycling and resource efficiency. So I would like to highlight a number of actions in these areas. And one cross-cutting uh, cross action is the definition of critical raw materials. So the EU identified a list of 14 critical raw materials on the basis of that these materials in particular are particularly concentrated in uh, a few producing countries around the world. Uh, they are particularly important for the economic value chain, but they're also uh, generally very difficult to recycle and difficult to substitute. Now, this list of critical raw materials is like a policy tool for the, for the Commission and other policymakers, so it can help us to identify uh, priority actions. But it's a dynamic concept, which means that it requires constant monitoring, it needs to be updated, 
And what is also important in that respect, uh, we will not limit our actions to a list of critical raw materials only. In the so-called international pillar, if I can call it like this, we want to have more and more dialogues and agreements with third countries with the aim to secure access to raw materials. But we also want to make more use of our uh, development policy instruments to create win-win situations. As Patrice has pointed out, many of the resources happen to be uh, located in developing countries, in particular, for instance, in Africa. And very recently, we agreed with our African partners to have a specific cooperation on raw materials, which will focus on three areas, governance, investment, and geological knowledge and skills. I said that there is indeed still a potential in Europe, but we have to do something about the framework conditions, and the conditions can be quite different from one member state to another. And the Commission is playing a, like a facilitator role in this context, and together with the member states we have identified a number of what you could call best practices in terms of the national minerals policy, land use planning policy, but also minerals exploration and extraction authorization process that is very clear, understandable, and could help to streamline the administrative process. So we will continue work in this area. Very important are efforts to uh, enhance the EU's knowledge base on raw materials. So we have to see how we can promote more synergies between the different national geological service, services because this could be a good basis for uh, initiating joint projects and we could think of a harmonized minerals database or a European minerals uh, yearbook for instance. But we also should uh, continue to promote research and development in the raw materials value chain. So all the way from extraction to substitution. The third pillar, as I mentioned, is about increasing opportunities for resource efficiency and recycling because we do have a potential also in terms of our urban mines in Europe. And some of the actions we need to take here are aimed at improving, for instance, the collection and treatment of waste. One could think, for instance, of mobile phones, but also uh, using eco-design instruments to promote a more efficient use of raw materials and ensure a higher recyclability of products. Unfortunately, a lot of our waste uh, is leaving Europe in an illegal way and often ends up in third countries where it's being dismantled, uh, often under very poor social and environmental conditions. One could think of end-of-life vehicles or electronic equipment. So there is a need to develop specific actions to improve the situation, uh, which means at European level strengthening our waste shipment regulation and our policy document is considering a whole range of action for instance, developing precise and workable inspection standards which could be applied by all the member states, but also um, promoting more technologies for the detection and tracking of illegal shipments. And another idea is uh, look into the feasibility of a global certification scheme for recycling facilities in third countries. It's very important uh, to know that one potential action uh, could be an innovation partnership on raw materials. It's something the Commission is currently assessing. There is already a pilot partnership underway, which is called Healthy Aging, but raw materials has been identified as a potential theme for future innovation partnerships. And why is this so important? Because in its actions, it could cover all the three pillars that I've mentioned so far. So it would uh, initiate uh, research and innovation actions, bringing uh, different stakeholders in Europe together uh, along the entire value chain of raw materials. So it would look at innovative technologies for exploration, extraction, recycling and substitution. So we're currently assessing uh, the potential for this and uh, the Commission will make a proposal um, probably even by this summer, and then it's up to the member states to see on whether this is a good idea and whether they agree that this should be a priority. But this could potentially be something very uh, important and very big for the future. In relation to the entire raw material strategy and the, the strategy document that has been adopted on the 2nd of February, it's very important to have the support of member states and other political institutions. 
and very recently the Council expressed its support for the different actions that we have announced in our communication and encourage us to go uh, further with that. And the European Parliament is currently debating um, our communication and is preparing a report on this. It's being discussed currently in different committees. So there again we hope that we'll get uh, also the support of the European Parliament um, to take this work further but also that we in future get the support of Council and European Parliament for a possible innovation partnership. So I thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thanks very much, Paul. Now you notice the map that Paul put up uh, early in his presentation when he showed the map of where all the different uh, uh, metals are coming from. There wasn't really anything leading from Europe, and, and that could be because our next speaker hasn't been quite busy enough going and looking for them. So, um, Patrick Redmond works for Tech Resources in charge of exploration in Europe. And you've got a spade in your briefcase, have you, Patrick, as well? Sorry? You've got a spade in your briefcase, spade, have you? Spade, a pickaxe. <laughs> Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm here today to give you a perspective from, from, from the minerals, exploration, and, and mining industry. As Richard said, uh, introduce me. I am from the corporate world, but uh, I am a geologist by training. So I will uh, talk a little bit about, uh, about geology dur during my talk. Um, You've seen from the previous presentations that the demand for metals is only going up. All the, the fundamentals, that are, the main fundamental driving it is just simply population growth. Um, and it's a global phenomenon. It's driven by the, um, by the developing, developing countries. So there is a real need, global need to continue to, pr to provide metals. But Europe is really not doing, not doing its part. Of course, Europe is very well endowed with minerals. There might be a perception out there in some quarters that uh, you know, all the minerals, all the metallic minerals of Europe have essentially been used up after centuries of mining. I mean, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, as Luis said, a lot of mining has been at relatively shallow depths, so there's a, there's huge potential to find deeper deposits, and as prices go up and technology improves, those deposits at deeper, at greater depths can, can be mined. A uh, good example, Tara Mines, the largest uh, zinc mine in Europe, in, in Ireland, started at just below surface. They're now at 1,000 meters depth and still profitably, profitably mining. So this, this particular map here just shows uh, the distribution of a, a number of different uh, uh, resources, deposits. I've chosen copper, iron, nickel, and zinc. You will notice Ireland is, is practically covered by red dots, and that's the, the Irish uh, zinc, zinc ore field, close, close to my heart. Um, you'll notice the distribution is not, is not uniform. Um, in Scandinavia, you have, you have copper deposits. Finland has a lot of nickel. The Iberian pyrite belt has copper and other base metals, so on and so forth. So Europe is well endowed. However, production in Europe is declining. Um, and it's, even right now, is a very small percent of, of world supply. Critical metals, in particular rare earth metals, have gotten a lot of attention recently. Turns out they really represent a very small part, in terms of dollar value, of the global mining industry, but they're, they're critical to a lot of new green technologies. Um, and they've really focused people's attention on the fact that Europe, and, and in the US as well, is highly dependent on imports from other countries. It's not that, and it's not that Europe and the US doesn't have natural uh, mineral resources with these elements. It's just they haven't been developed for de for decades. Um, so critical met metals essentially have, have drawn our attention to this issue, but it's broader than that. If you look at the major metals, and these are the infrastructure metals that Patrice talked about. If you want to build a modern society. Uh, you, need, you need to have these metals. You need, you need iron ore to make steel. For every tonne of steel you make, you need three tonnes of metallurgical coal to smelt it. If you want to stop it rusting, you need, you need to coat it with zinc. So every car has, has ten, roughly 10 kilos of zinc coating it. Um, if, you want to, uh, if you want to put wiring in a wind turbine, you need, you need, you need copper and so on and so forth. And this, these pie charts shown in blue are the uh, European, European production of these major, major metals, and as you can see, they're all relatively small. Uh, the, the best of these is, is, is zinc. 
And again, coming, coming back to Ireland, I'll proudly fly the Irish flag again. And this is because Irish production of zinc is, is, is high. There are currently two, two operating mines. But again, this is, this is the best of the major metals in Europe produces 7.6% of, of the world's total supply, but consumes uh, far, far more than that amount. So why does Europe produce uh, such a small amount of metals? Now, there's lots, there's lots of reasons. There are political reasons, there are social reasons, environmental reasons. Um, but fundamentally, it comes down to one thing. Uh, the, the lifeblood of mining is exploration. So if you don't, if you, mining by its nature depletes resources and you must find new ones to, conti to continue the mining, the mining process. Your uh, exploration expenditure in Europe is very low. It's low in absolute terms. And if you look at this particular graph, it shows it has uh, years along the bottom and shown in the dark blue, for each year is expenditure uh, in Europe. Okay, so Europe is in blue, and you can see the other jurisdictions, regions, I should say, Asia, Latin America, etc., in the in the other colours. If you look at 2010, uh, 23 billion uh, US dollars was uh, was was raised by, and I should say, this is only the small companies. This is jun junior exploration companies, which constitute about 50% of of world exploration spending. 23 billion was raised. But in, in, in absolute terms um, and relative terms, the amount spent in Europe is relatively small. And this is because expiration dollars, expiration euros, will go to the regions where, where they're welcomed and where governments um, will encourage expiration. And where expiration companies who, who, are, who are out to make money, let's face it, think they can get the best returns. So where, where does the money go? It goes to North America and South America, in particular Latin America. And here is a, another representation of really the same point. It shows, um, this is total exp exploration uh, spending. And you can see the top 10 countries uh, shown and the percent uh, of exploration dollars spent in each. Um, and none of those countries are European. Europe is somewhere in there in, in the rest of the world. And again, this is because the perception uh, among exploration decision makers in the exploration business is not to spend, not to spend their, their money in, in Europe. It's interesting too to look at where exploration or what commodities exploration uh, expenditure is, is spent on. Um, and of course, it's, it's, not, it's not on critical metals, not, not on, certainly not a large percent of it. The bulk, almost half, of exploration spending globally is spent on, on gold exploration. Uh, base metals would be second. That's copper, lead, zinc, nickel. Um, and then diamonds, PGMs, platinum group metals, and then other. So somewhere in that other category are, are the, are the so-called criti critical metals. So there's a, there's a structural issue here within the exploration business. You know, Europe is concerned about security of supply, but we're not concerned about security of supply of gold, right? Um, we're concerned about the, the infrastructure metals and the critical metals, but that's not where exploration companies are spending their money globally, uh, because the rate of return on, on gold exploration is, is higher. So that, uh, that really summarizes uh, the, the, the state of the exploration business in Europe. Um, and with my last slide here, I'd like to just give some ideas as to perhaps what, what can be done in Europe to, to, you know, to, to, uh, to, to change this situation. Um, the most basic one, easy, much easier said than done, is to encourage mineral exploration within Europe, as other countries have done. Countries like Canada and Australia have been extremely successful in encouraging exploration. They've done this. Um, through tax incentives. They've done it by spending public money on large geophysical surveys that, uh, that will then be used by exploration companies to focus in on certain areas. Um, and we could, in particular, if we are worried about strategic commodities, focus, focus on them. Um, but this, this is difficult, and you really have to, you have to change a trend that's quite long-standing. I think it is worthwhile 
for uh, Europe to develop a comprehensive mineral inventory of actually what we have and potentially what we could have to prevent what I would call sterilization of resources. If there is a zinc deposit or a copper deposit in Europe, um, we should, the, the jurisdiction should know about it so we don't put a motorway on top of it or a shopping center or, or a town. And this, this feeds into a long-term policy. Uh, another point would be to fund and to support industry ac uh, academic research and innovation in exploration and extraction technologies. I think Europe has a big role to play here. And finally, again, easier said than done, but to implement policies similar to countries like Japan and China uh, to secure supplies from, from other parts of the world in the long term. Thank you. Right, thanks very much, Patrick. Okay, so um, the first four speakers have outlined some of the dimensions of the problem, and we've heard a little bit more detail about what needs to be done to stimulate exploration in Europe, and also what the European Commission is hoping to do in order to have a strategic framework. Richard Harrington from the Museum of Natural History in London, final speaker. Can you tie some of these uh, strands together for us, Richard? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I hope in the next eight minutes, perhaps, to revisit what we've heard uh, some of the previous speakers talk about, but also perhaps uh, talk a little bit about um, the reason not to be totally gloomy about, uh, about the situation. Okay, so we've we heard a little bit about um, some discussion about how secure is mineral supply for, uh, in general, and not only for Europe, but worldwide. Um, I think it's quite clear we're in an era now where we've, we're moving from cheap and easy to uh, expensive and difficult exploitation uh, strategies. Um, and there are even some suggestions that we may be running out of uh, some metals soon, but although we've heard uh, plenty of evidence to suggest that's not the case, and indeed others are suggesting that technological innovation will get us around supply issues. Um, this is the so-called opportunity cost paradigm, um, you know, using the glib phrase that we um, we didn't stop using um, tools because we ran out of flint. We, we found something better to use. And uh, the, obviously, the, these, this could be possible for some thing, uh, other things. But then the bottom thing I want to talk about a little bit is the uh, environmental limits to some of these, which may curtail supply. Obviously, mine, mining's not the most uh, socially acceptable uh, uh, thing to do in a lot of places in the world. And there is competition between that and the use of the planet by um, the, the, the living beings that live on it. Okay, we heard major, major commodities are sourced from multiple deposits, so therefore there's a diverse supply chain and for a lot of the major metals. So we, we can see, as Luis was saying, absolutely, the, are we going to run out? No, we're, we're not in the near future. Um, and many of the minor commodities, which include some of those strategic metals, are actually byproducts of some of these larger mines. And it's really not uh, feasible to explore for uh, these m minor metals very often on their own. They come as a result of uh, major commodity mining. However, there are some uh, metals that do have problems of, of uh, restricted uh, because of political reasons, perhaps geographic reasons, or undesirable supply chains. And we, we know a little bit about blood diamonds, which uh, to some degree has been addressed by industry. But other metals like tantalum, niobium, and the rare earth elements and pattern group elements are uh, perhaps susceptible to some of these issues. One thing we haven't talked about is actually um, the degree of, of corporate uh, monopoly uh, on some of these commodities. This graph here, which is from the, uh, the German Geological Survey, uh, basically the graph here is showing the, uh, the degree of concentration of supply into uh, small com uh, into uh, companies or not. So anything at the bottom left there means the diversity, there's a much higher diversity of supply. And things going further up to the right of the diagram indicate a more restricted number of companies controlling that commodity. And obviously some of the strategic metals are up in there. We can see niobium, tantalum. But even some of the major metals, like nickel, you can see uh, a are pretty close to being up there with the um, with those that, where the co corporate control is in the hands of a number, of, uh, a few number of small company, uh, small number of companies. We've also there's a geographical monopoly situation. Uh, we've heard about perhaps about China in the in the news about rare earth supply. 
um, to the point where because a US factory that supplies the rare earth magnets to the US military was, was actually taken over by um, Chinese interests, uh, polit politicians begin to, began to wake up to the fact that uh, there was beginning to be a geographical control to some of these things. However, China's only got 37% uh, of world rare earth resources. There are plenty of other resources around the world. But the, t the time taken to get those into production is one of the barriers we have. Ethical issues. This is obviously something that's uh, pretty important in some areas. Um, you might be aware that uh, parts of the world like R Rwanda were areas where we could source tantalum and unregulated supply uh, in the 90s from those, those areas was uh, giving cause for concern because it was funding the militia's ability to uh, create, uh, destabilize the country. So, um, one of the questions you might ask is, do, do we actually need some kind of ethical fair trade process for these kind of commodities where some form of branding is put onto uh, metals to ensure we know where they've come from? And actually that would, help, uh, that would help in Europe. People would get a better understanding of where these things are coming from. If you uh, go and buy something in your supermarket, you know where the fruits come from. But when you go and buy metals, you don't really know where the metals are coming from. And perhaps we should. In fact, the US have come some way down the track. They've got this Reform and Consumer Protection Act, whereby uh, if companies have to declare whether they're sourcing their metals from uh, ethically uh, uh, dodgy sources and um, areas of conflict. Um, another thing we haven't talked about, but this is sort of the last one of these sort of thorny issues, is, is, is uh, perhaps the carbon issue. Um, it's, it's a above the economic kind of criteria. This is an actual graph here showing the carbon budget of Australian gold production. It's quite, quite informative, really. On the bottom here, we've got the grade in grams per tonne. So basically, anything up the left here is very high grade. That means very high concentration of gold in the rock. And to the right, we get increasingly lower grade. And you can see on the y-axis here, we've got the CO2 cost for a kilogram of gold and you can see quite dramatically that the lower grade deposits are much more intensive uh, users of, of carbon. Not surpri surprising because you've got to break a lot more rock. Now at the moment this doesn't come into the equation because it's simply a cost equation for mining but at some point in time maybe there'll be carbon brought into the equation so uh, if you like there's a, a sort of an environmental, um, extra environmental um, criterion that might be applied. Okay, but, you know, we, we don't need to be um, too, too worried in, in many cases because I don't think we fully characterised our resources we have currently on the planet. Um, we haven't tested all the potential resource streams, um, and I'm using lithium here as an example. Currently, it's produced from Playa Lakes and, and hard rock uh, sources. But there are at least 14 lithium-bearing minerals that are potential ore minerals, and um, this excludes seawater. And if we put um, this example here, which is the Jadar deposit, which is recently discovered in Serbia in 2004, and actually what was in, uh, striking about this deposit is it, we found a totally new mineral in the deposit, which has been named Jadarite, which is a, a, a lithium sodium uh, borosilicate, and it's a completely new ore mineral that was unknown before 2006, and it's now a major potential source of lithium and boron inside Europe. But lithium is also potentially extractable from seawater, and if the price is right, or price is wrong, um, if, if say the, the price of uh, lithium carbonate tripled, um, it would make extraction of lithium from seawater economic. So this goes back to are we running out? Um, perhaps we're not if we can consider the full mineral diversity of the planet uh, for, for potential sources. And then my last point here is that we are moving towards this kind of idea. Um, if we look at the nickel market, current nickel production is largely from sulphide or dominated by sulphides but the, the world's resources are locked up in laterites. Um, but it's a completely different mineralogy for extraction, but this different mineralogy demands different processing technology. 
And we are rising to the challenge. We have an EU-funded project that actually is investigating this new change of technology. So my final slide here is bringing this all together, is um, mitigating these, these risks. I think there is a big scientific contribution we could make in the prediction of where mineral deposits are going to be found, new deposits are found, maybe at depth. We can look at substitution, but actually that's only causing a knock-on and we might be having to look at another raw material. So we need to build that into the equation. And part of the risk will be mitigated by the use of new technologies to extract uh, currently unknown resources. And new mineral species, indeed, are still there to be discovered. Um, but what this needs is, and we've heard it before, is a much clearer vertically integrated set of research strategies that integrate people who are looking for these deposits with the people who are actually using the end product and making, turning into the iPhones, the electric cars, and the kind of things that we use. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, Richard. I'm sure those of you who are geologists will have been heartened by Richard's first recommendation there that there should be a much greater need and demand for your skills and your ability. Well, now, it, now it's really over to you. Most of the rest of the session we'd like to give over to sort of questions and points and so on that you want to raise. There are a couple of uh, people I think you've got uh, handheld microphones to take around. I can see one over there. Okay, a couple more people. Um, and uh, Patrice and Paul, you've got that microphone uh, to use, and, and, and Louis and Patrick, you've got that one. Richard, we'll have to share, the, share this one. So um, who's, who's got something they'd like to put forward? Okay, gentleman here, right down the front, first of all, please. If you want to address any particular person, then of course do, if not uh, whoever. Okay, seems I, most apt my name's Steve Scott from the University of Toronto in Canada. Um, I noticed on the map that uh, I think that Luis showed the, the production, or at least the leading production of different countries, China is a leader of 10 of the, of the strategic commodities. And all the rest of the countries that have a leading commodity had one or two. Uh, now, China is a huge consumer, but they've obviously put in place the mechanisms for doing production in their country. Now, of course, they have the geology that allows that production, but it seems to me that Europe does too. Um, we've been hearing for, for 20 years or more that we need one more Pilbara uh, every five years. We need, a, we need our every year and so forth. I mean, that's, and that's, you know, for 20 years I've been hearing that, and this, we'd heard it again today. Um, and, and so why can Europe not put their act together? Is it entirely nimbyism or is it something else? Well, I think Pat Patrick gave us some uh, answers around exploration. Luis, do you have any, any more ideas you'd like to add to that? Well, are we going to know? I think uh, Patrick really explained the situation, uh, that it's, it's perception, it's more difficult, and I think the main point is what uh, uh, Richard has said, it was, we, have fin we are finishing the period of cheap and easy raw materials. And we have to change the paradigm. I hope at least, because this would be also an improvement also from the environmental point of view. I was just going to raise one more question. I don't know, Richard, may maybe you'd like to pick this one up. You, you were talking about a sort of fair trade element, perhaps. And I, and, and, and I think, Patrick, you also talked about regulation and so on, and whether companies actually saw Europe as the most profitable place they wanted to explore. And I wondered, you know, from this very narrow perspective of needing to ensure a supply of raw materials, you know, is there too much regulation in Europe? Well, I, I mean, I think that's, that's a possibility. I've seen from the UK perspective where um, even, you know, sort of well-crafted exploration programs that have the support of local people uh, evaluating mineral resources um, have, have stumbled because of a, um, you know, perhaps a, a, in the case of a, I'm thinking of a gold deposit in Scotland that was recently had planning permission turned down despite actual local people really wanting this to go ahead because of uh, a, a number of reasons. But there, there wasn't, and, I'm not, and I'm, not, I'm not commenting on whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, but there was no common strategy. So one of the regulatory authorities disagreed with what another one of them said. And I think maybe Europe suffer from the fact that we 
don't, from the natural resources point of view, we don't have a, a sort of floor to ceiling strategy on, on the natural resources that China have managed to implement. Presumably, it's perhaps easier in a one country uh, scenario to do that. In, in Europe, best will in the world, we're, we're great partners, but we have different mineral laws, for example. UK uh, minerals are generally owned by the, the, the people who own the land, whereas, of course, in other countries, they are national assets. So um, I, I think that's been one of the reasons there hasn't been a, 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 an overall strategy in Europe. But I think people haven't thought about the thing from top to bottom in that, in that way before in, the, in Europe. Okay, let's take another point. Yes, I would uh, like. Um, okay, chat with the yeah. mic. We've already got the microphone. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Luc André. I'm involved as uh, an expert in the partnership between Africa and, uh, and Europe, especially in size, but I have to move to raw materials in a way due to the pressure. And so what, what I have to, to say here is that the, we, are, we have a political concern here in Europe because it's really a mess. It's confused. The poli there is no a, a common political view in terms, of, especially of the fair, fair trade, especially the fair trade, uh, which is a, a big problem in Africa because I have a lot of experience working in Africa. And there we are confronted with a, a, what I said as a, a poverty trap because the artisanal mining system is, has increased so much in the last two, three years. This is a social problem. And since we will not have solved this, we will have a problem. Because the, the pressure there is so high that we have a lot of disturbance and probably a series of new conflict uh, uh, developing in the, in the nearly recent future. And so my question is, what will be the plans at the European level to try to get a plan to, to solve this problem? Uh, Patrice or Paul, you want to pick them up? Um, yes. Uh, I can tell you a few words about that. I have been working at the European Commission in managing a fund which was in support of the mining industry in the so-called Africa, Caribbean, Pacific zone. Um, that fund was known as SISMI. It no longer exists since 10 years. Let's say that in the Commission, like in the EU member states, there was not much interest for minerals up to the recent few years. Now, uh, very recently, for the first time ever, the Africa, Caribbean and Pacific ministers of mines came together in Brussels in November, in December last year and uh, uh, they met, I personally participated to that meeting and uh, they are now discussing with the European Commission which is willing on its own side to relaunch that cooperation uh, to develop a new partnership between the EU and um, say those uh, developing countries and that uh, needs to be, of course, a win-win partnership. And you are right to mention that the issue of small-scale mining is of particular importance because it affects uh, the life of uh, several tens of millions of people if you count all the dependents uh, on that activity across the developing countries. So uh, the good news is there are ongoing talks. It's part of the raw materials initiative that has been described by Paul. Uh, when exactly and what actions will start, it's still too early to say. Uh, there are a number of persons, including myself, working on it. Um, but that partnership should be relaunched, and that's very important for the developing world, and it's very important for uh, the developing countries themselves. Given, though, that there is, uh, in, to some extent, a sort of competition between different parts of the world for resources. It, we, we've seen, for example, with, with, with forestry and, and fish in Africa, for example, that if, if one block goes, on, goes in and tries to do a sort of deal that's ethically sound, there's every possibility that another block will go in and be very happy to do deals that are not ethically sound. And, and you can see a scenario here, I, I, well, let me put it this way, can you see a scenario here in which Europe sort of loses out there? If, if I may, I, I would still like to uh, add some comments on the previous question, if, if you don't mind, Pleasure. because I think it's an important one. Um, because in terms of cooperating with Africa, I think what we need to, to do, what we need to stress is 
that it should be based really on the needs of both African and EU partners. And this is why um, we've looked at both uh, our EU raw materials initiative, but also their uh, African mining vision. And uh, I think you'll find in the African mining vision a particular attention being paid, for instance, to the problems of artisanal mining, but also many other issues related to mining sustainable development. And for instance, the need to um, have diversification of their economies and, and to promote their downstream uh, industries and processing of, of raw materials. Um, so one, one of the aspects uh, that I would like to highlight where we want to work on in the future is uh, increasing cooperation between European and African geological services, uh, surveys because if they have a better understanding of the, the, what, is, what is in their soil and the value, they will be also be in a better position to negotiate with other countries. And all this relates to capacity building, knowledge. So this is like the way forward we want to go uh, with this. Okay. Uh, John, down the front here, has hand up for a long time. It looks like the, the difference of food production, where I think we need to have independence and to have food production in Europe, that for mineral production, this is not, there is not a good business case for local resource extraction. The best business is to use our tertiary sector activities, research, technologies, and uh, to identify, I mean, in uh, some of the continents where the production costs are lower, some good partners where we can have sustainable collaboration that includes, for instance, uh, applying geological research, applying our tools, uh, capacity building. And so how, how would you see that this can work without transferring everything and then being over dependent from uh, the, the source of the mineral resources? Uh, how do you see this, this collaboration with the, the external uh, or, uh, producers of mineral resources? Who'd like to pick that one up? Perhaps it again falls into your, into your bailiwick, Paul, does it? So if I understand your question correctly, you're sort of concerned about when there is a case of technology transfer that they will no. be in a certain... No, actually, my main, my main point is that we should concentrate on tertiary level of activities, mm -hmm. research, technologies, and uh, then uh, from Africa, okay, they, they should concentrate on, on production, and, and uh, so we, should, we have to f find a harmonious solution because we are in charge of prospection then we can also eventually help in regulation, in, in getting some fair principle that both parts would abide. So Europe shouldn't really worry too much if it doesn't have its own supply. It should just take the supply from where in the world that supply can naturally come. And Europe should put on the table what it can most effectively supply, things like technology and, and skills. But you, but you need some geopolitical uh, uh, guarantee. Mm. And this is, can be built up because there is a good complementarity between our resource, which is more tertiary or past experience in mining, and the resources from, from Africa or other continents. Um, yeah, would you like to, Lewis? Absolutely. I think it may be on all the time. Okay, yeah. I'm not sure if I have understood well. If, uh, if what you are saying is that uh, we should concentrate on that is clean and leave the dirty parts to other continents, I don't think it would be very sustainable. The new technology should include also a clean approach. So that's something we could bring on. Of course, we should bring that, but we should also take our part. And as Patrick has shown, actually from a geological point of view, in Europe, there, is, there are ore deposits. There are ore deposits, but the benefits to cost is so high. So is that really um, a good business uh, We have, uh, perhaps, uh, Pat Patrick can, show, can explain the case of one of the lowest grade copper mines in, in the world, and this in Europe. Yeah. Uh, uh, so this Patrice, not Patrick in that case, because there's a Patrick and a Patrice. <laughs> to confuse the issue. Um, so uh, yes, let me tell you uh, that mining in Europe is far from being finished. Uh, um, uh, if I uh, ask the audience, where is possibly the lowest grade profitable open pit copper mine of the world located? Uh, the Swiss, uh, no, not you pair, sorry. <laughs> no, no, uh, you're not eligible. So what's the reply? No, that's wrong. 
<laughs> That's in Sweden. <laughs> no, uh, so uh, that uh, copper mine, that, uh, it's the largest open pit uh, base metal mine in Europe. It's ITIC in Sweden, um, which is very interesting because it's 0.29% of copper in the reserves. So take your pocket calculator, you will see that's not much money in the ground. It's 0.1 gram per ton of gold and a little bit of molybdenum. So nothing to be that excited about, except that this is a very large scale deposit. And Boliden, who is the owner of the mine, found it so profitable that they invested an extra $500 million to double the production capacity to ramp it up from 18 million tons per year to 36 million tons of year. It's located north of the polar circle in one of the countries in the world which has the highest cost of labor and also possibly the most stringent environmental regulations. And nevertheless, this is operating and it's very profitable. So what's the key to that miracle? Uh, the key here is technology, it's extremely good engineering, it's a very long-standing partnership between universities, technology centers, and here you have a distinguished uh, metallurgist from the University of Lulea, um, who is part of that partnership. Uh, technology providers, companies who provide uh, drilling equipment, crushing machines, and so on and so forth, and the mining industry itself. And that partnership exists since many decades, and it's supported by the state. So that's, that's Europe, and that can happen in Europe. And Finland, of course, is another case, Ireland and so on. So there are still a number of European countries where mining is active, and I would say even developing, because you have brand new deposits coming online in Sweden and Finland I would know about. Okay, let's take another point. Okay, chap, chap just in the middle there with a sort of stripy jumper on. Yeah. Andreas Petersbach, University of Bergen. Um, I'd like to point out the first point that uh, Mr. Redmond uh, from the cooperation side actually mentioned. Um, you mentioned the policies um, that Australia and Canada have um, came, or came up with to promote um, mining in their countries. And then you mentioned just Sweden or Finland. What all these countries have in common is a really low population density. I mean, there might be huge reserves all over Europe, but um, there are also huge populations, or population density that is really high. So anywhere in, at least in Central Europe, where you would want to set up a mine, within a radius of, say, 10 kilometers, there would be 10,000 people to complain. Uh, how do you see that problem? So isn't it basically all boiling down to the problem of public opinion? Um. I think I would make a couple of points. You know, you, you are right, in areas of, of dense population, it, it is, of course, more difficult to, to, to build a mine, but, but it's actually not impossible, particularly for, for, for underground mines. Um, the Navan deposit, Tara Mines in, in Ireland, it's the largest zinc mine in Europe, fifth biggest in the world, and it basically stretches under the town of Navan. Uh, you drive over it every day when you drive through the town, but most people don't even know it's there uh, because it's down. You know, down to a thousand meters depth. So it, it can be done, particularly with underground mines, and, and that's uh, the point that was made earlier about the depth of, of discovery um, increasing. You're going to increasingly see uh, more and more underground resources being, being developed, so it's not impossible. Um, and then, I mean, there are large parts of Europe that, that are not densely populated. Um, I mean, the northern parts of Scandinavia in particular, I mean, you could develop very large, and there's potential to find very large copper deposits, uh, iron, more iron ore deposits in areas that are not densely populated. Even parts of Ireland, uh, the Midlands of Ireland, uh, you had a very good community support for, for an underground mine. So a lot of this is perception, but I think, and not, not necessarily reality. With a good regulatory framework, permitting process, um, you, can, you can put put mines into production in Europe, and with the right technology and approach, they don't have to necessarily be cost, uh, high cost producers. And I, I certainly wasn't advocating any return to a, a system whereby there would be state subsidies or anything like that. I'm, I, I mean, I'm, from, I'm from, you know, from, a, from a mining company, and we're not, not looking for anything like that. Um, I think, don't think governments should be, should, be do, should be doing that, government mining agencies, I'm not in favor of that at all. Um, 
I'm talking about uh, mines that can be developed in Europe that are that are highly profitable and, and that that you know that that comply with best practice. Luis, you wanted to come in on that. Yes, because I think you have touched a very important point with the 10,000 persons uh, complaining. And they, I think uh, most of us here, we geologists, and we have a responsibility. Therefore, have, for example, some cases, as I'm thinking of a gold deposit in Romania, where there is a re huge environmental problem because of past mining activity. In, in fact, the, pro the, the way to solve that would be to retreat the tailings and this could be done with a modern, modern operation, but because of public perception that mining is bad and mining cannot be done in Europe, sometimes even with help of the European community, some districts have been closed down. Um, that's another aspect. That what I would say is that in this case, for example, this particular case in Romania, actually the, from an environmental point of view, the logical thing in my point of view would be to Explo exploit the mine and exploit the old tailings. But because of exactly what you are saying, this is not possible. And in between, the tailings at surface are continually roasting, oxidizing, and as you know, that is the main f uh, cause of contamination because the parite at surface is producing sulfuric acid. And this could be stopped if permit to do the retreat the tailings to do the mine could be done. But that is not possible because of the public perception and because politicians sometimes pe people don't want in backyard or don't want to lose elections and, and this kind of thing. And I think as geologists we have a responsibility to try to find the correct solutions. Right. There's another hand up a bit further forward in this same block of seats. It's me. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Shuai Yan from China. Lots of talk about China. Uh, first, I'm very happy to be here because I got lots of information about this presentation. Uh, before, I think I knew that China has 22% of the world's population, but after today, I knew that we have 37% of uh, rare earth element. Uh, I have heard that uh, some months ago, uh, China has uh, reduced uh, the uh, rare earth element to export. I think that is uh, our uh, national uh, development strategy. It's not intention to control the market. It's just like strategy for, for example, the EU have the uh, weapon ban to many countries, I, I think. And here we are talking about the uh, uh, element of the material crisis. I think here we are trying to find the solution and the solution is definitely not just selling or buying. I'm not a geologist, I'm studying forestry here. I think before I like to see, as you have felt, Vienna is very beautiful city and Austria has lots of forest. Uh, it's 50% of forest uh, here, but uh, for example, if China, we have only less than 20% forest, if we said, okay, now we need more uh, woody products, we want to uh, buy some forest in Austria, can you cut 20% of your forest land to us? I think every Austrian will not be happy about that. There's maybe a difference, though, in that you can replant forests, but you can't go and put new rare earth elements in the earth to take yeah, them Yeah, yeah, that's, I want to make the point. So maybe we can find another solution for this. I mean, uh, we know in, I have been to the cities in northern part of China where they really produce lots of this rare earth element. And uh, with the high amount of uh, productivity, there are also very serious environmental problems and uh, also lots of criticisms of this. I think just because of this reason, the government uh, wants to reduce the productivity. But uh, maybe the solution could be like the EU could uh, support some projects there to improve the technology or to do some other ways and you can produce some products there and just like some telecom companies, they produce some products and then uh, they export these products from China to world world and everybody can benefit from that. 
So again, yes. it's a sort of constructive partnership that our friend down the front here was, was talking about with different players bringing different things to the table. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Who'd like to pick up on that? Richard, you want to go there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, you, you hit on an interesting point there. I think that and the, the other gentleman down here talking about the skills we have in Europe, and I think we should definitely not uh, underestimate that's probably one of our largest assets is the, the, the skill set of our people. And we have a lot of highly trained geoscientists. We have, we've heard about the, uh, the, the experience of, of, of mining, perhaps now in the more sophisticated mining we're seeing in Sweden and Finland and, and, and Ireland. Um, we do have a lot to offer uh, countries like China, perhaps, from the technology side. And we should be looking to explore those more because I think you're right. That I think this rare earth extraction in China, a lot of it's done by artisanal miners, small guys using acid in buckets. And, you know, this is not sustainable in a modern society. And at some point, presumably in, in China, that will change. And the technology will be needed to perhaps put a, a, a more sophisticated industry in. And perhaps that's where Europe can help in return for securing uh, supplies to uh, assets in, in China. It would be a good way forward, certainly. I think we've got time just to take two or three more quick points. Uh, okay. Just, just very quick, just Patrick. Very quick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, there was a lot of talk about, about China, but the, the, I mean, the fact is that China, Chinese demand uh, underpins metal prices at the moment, so the global mining business is, is completely dependent on China. Should there be a downturn there, we're, we're, we're in big trouble. I mean, other countries are coming through, India and others, but China is the backbone of it right now. And there's huge potential for, uh, for Western companies to collaborate, cooperate with, with Chinese companies. China has lots of money. Uh, it's mainly denominated in dollars, which is devaluing. So, I mean, China has taken uh, the steps of, of investing overseas, and I think there, there's huge potential. Tech, the company I work for, uh, and, uh, the CIC, Chinese, Chinese, uh, China Investment Corporation, put in 1.5 billion into tech in 2009, a time when we needed some cash. Bought, did that investment at $17. Tech recently hit $60. So you do the math on that. Um, they uh, they had a huge, huge, huge gain on that. So I think there's, I am very positive about, about the outlook in terms of cooperation with, with Chinese companies. Thanks very much. So there's a lady sort of about halfway back on there. You could do with the microphone. Thanks. Um, I'm not an expert on any of this stuff. I'm an oceanographer, not a geologist. So this may seem like a terribly naive question. But I feel one thing we haven't talked about is whether Europe could use less of these things. I mean, how, how much of their demand is... <laughs> how much of this demand is driven by us being a consumerist throwaway culture? Right? Somebody yeah. said something about some metal that goes into mobile phones. How many mobile phones do we throw out? If you're going to have an EU policy on recycling, why not have an EU policy on making stuff that lasts? <laughs> Good point. Does the European Commission, or uh, Patrice, you'd like to pick that up? Um, I am an observer to the UN uh, resource panel, um, and definitely I support uh, your statement that uh, we should implement the three R philosophy across the Western world, not only Europe, but all the rich uh, countries, the developed countries, the three R's means reduce. So how to develop services, what we need are services such as transport, heating, lighting, housing, that is what we need. So how to obtain these services with using less resources. It's not how to deprive ourselves uh, from lighting, heating and so on, because nobody will accept that, but how to develop those services with using less resources. The second R is recycle. So, and the third one is uh, reuse, because if you take a car, for instance, at the end of its life, in the car, you have various parts which are not end of life and which could be, uh, if they are certified, of course, no way to uh, put junk into a new car, they could be possibly reused uh, and have their lifetime extended. So all these pathways are important for the future, I fully agree. But unfortunately, the bad news is that uh, despite all the progress we can do there and we need to do, uh, we will need more primary 
raw materials coming from mines. And that is not because only our nonsense, sometimes nonsense lifestyles, it's also because the demographic trends across the earth. If China nowadays needs a lot of steel, of copper, of rare earths and so on, it's not only to be the factory of the world as they are, but it's also to develop its uh, own economy. I would like to underline that uh, one of the great performances of the Chinese government is, has to be, uh, they took out of poverty 300 million persons across the, say, the 30 last years. That needs to be highlighted. Uh, so, uh, but still, you have over 100 million people who are migrant workers uh, living in utmost poverty across China. So still there's a long way to develop that country. And this long way requires a lot of raw materials. And then after China, you have India, you have Brazil, you have many of these emerging countries. That means that whatever the progress you need to do in these three are, uh, just the global demographic trends and the desire of a large chunk of the world population to enjoy better lifestyles means a dramatic demand for minerals and metals. Has anyone else got a burning point that they really want to make? Because we are coming right to the end, and if anyone has, I'd like them to make it. Okay, final point then from you. Okay, this is a very quick one, but I just have to say that in this presentation so far, I haven't seen any mention really on the availability and price of, of energy in this whole thing, because that's all very linked to this one as well. Yeah. Richard, do you want to pick that up? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I showed the slide there on carbon, which obviously relates to energy. And, but energy is a cost that gets written into all of these, um, all the equations as to whether they're economic or not. But I think what we, you, you've got to look at is that, that that's a price that we can put a value on. So that energy would be factored in as a price to all, all that sort of exploitation. And there's two sides to it, how your energy is produced and actual cost of producing things. This is why I, I showed some slides also on these technologies that are perhaps less energy intensive. We see mining moving towards things like hydrometallurgy because they potentially are more energy efficient. And I think that's uh, you know, where industry are responding to, to that issue. But I, you know, energy is a, is a cost like any, any other, but the added factor is perhaps looking at the carbon value of that energy, which is another cost that at the moment is not factored into any of these, um, these sort of mining activities. Okay, thanks very much. Now, I'd just like to give the floor briefly to all of our speakers just for some, some, a few final thoughts, sort of summarising thoughts, and um, just like to go along the panel uh, from, from my left to, to, to my right. And I guess might be useful just to think a little bit about you know how how we go from here you know we've, we've heard about a lot about the problem and some of the ideas that are being thrashed around I'm just quite keen to find out what you all think actually is going to happen in the next 10 years whether we are going to manage this situation Luis would you like to um, kick off yes uh, well I would like to make uh, just two points one really knowledge about the raw material chain that is something that we as geoscientists, we can do a lot, and we, it is needed, you see, that the society is not, in general, well informed. The second thing, on the social level, to address some of the problems, environmental energy problems that have been pointed here, we have to arrive to the point where, really, the raw materials have the real cost, that is integrating also the environmental uh, costs, integrating also the cost of social disruption. We are is nothing, absolutely nothing, has been done yet on this level. Okay, Patrick Redman. Uh, <clears throat> no, I mean, for me, it's, um, it's certainly, it's not, it's not doom and gloom. Um, I think the, you know, we are in you know, a so-called super cycle of, of commodity um, uh, increase in demand. Uh, I don't see it, it stopping for a long time. Um, and that is even factoring in more, more recycling and reuse and less use and, and all of these things. I think there's just a fundamental demand as population grows for, for, for commodities. So I think the outlook from, uh, you know, from an industry point of view is, is, extremely, is extremely positive. Um, and the opportunity to use new technologies um, to, you know, to create a better lifestyle for people 
is, is out there, so it's very exciting. Um, I think you know, we as Europeans need to, we need to address this very fundamental point that we are, we are happy to use metals in our daily lives. We've grown used to it, but we have uh, lost touch with where those metals come from. We've just spent a long time um, accepting that it's, uh, they're accessible and cheap from other parts of the world. I think um, if we had an, a bigger indigenous mining business, we would be more in touch with where these metals are coming from. And we can regulate and we can ensure that it's on an environmentally friendly way. At the end of the day, every car we have needs roughly 10 kilos of zinc on it. There's really no substitute. Uh, you know, where, where do we as Europeans want that zinc coming from? Do we want it coming from a well-run, well-regulated mine in Europe that creates jobs, that, that creates revenue, creates wealth? Or do we want that zinc coming from some other part of the world where maybe the same standards don't apply? I think that's a, that's a, that's a big question. Well, clearly we, want, clearly we want it coming from a tech resources mine. Uh, wherever it is, Patrick. Richard, final thoughts. Yeah, I guess my thought on it is I think I, I, I reiterate what Patrick's saying. I think we need more, as a, as a people, we need to understand more about where these metals are coming from and what they're being used for. Because I think if we have more information about that as a society, I think we're going to be better placed to making these decisions about using less. It's a nice idea that we're going to use less, but... You, you try and tell that to somebody in India who's going to get a house built and wants you know, a new car and so on. And it, we have to balance the fact that people out there want those kind of commodities. We've got to look for a way around the problem. And I think if, if we can educate people to understanding the, the, the balances in you know, utilising metal for the chairs, for the building that we're sitting in, for the microphone I'm using, and once people understand that, when we go to the supermarket, we can see where all these products come from. You know, you can sort, you can choose then whether you're going to eat lots from, or you're going to buy something local. And I think if we could bring that perhaps into the metal market, then more people would be engaged in the decision making process, and we might then be able to uh, see a better way forward. But we're not going to get around the problem that we need more raw materials currently because we have these de developing economies. So therefore, we've got to look for a way of making that impact on the planet much more acceptable. I'm not saying it's good. I mean, the best possible word, we, we wouldn't have to dig holes in the ground, but we do. That's the reality. Paul? In terms of the EU's raw material strategy, which is like an integrated strategy, so trying to tie all the EU's policies together, uh, trade, external relations, industrial policy, environment, etc., research, innovation, so it's a whole lot of, of different policy areas that are now brought together on the theme of raw materials. And I think that's an important step forward. The, the awareness certainly is there at a political level and at a policy level. Uh, to give you some examples, the access to raw materials is recognized as, a, as an essential element of the Europe's 2020 strategy or the EU's industrial policy. So that kind of recognition is, is there. It means that the issues are not going to go away overnight. And the policy framework is like the start of a process. Some actions have already been taken at EU level and also at national level, but more should be done. Uh, involving member states, involving uh, industry, research community. So I think all of us can play a role there. And from a, a very pragmatic point of view, I would invite you to uh, keep close track of our raw materials webpage uh, of the European Commission, of DG Enterprise. For example, I hope that very shortly, uh, around mid of uh, this month, we'll be able to launch a public consultation to which everybody interested can participate, specifically on the innovation partnership and raw materials that I've mentioned. Patricia, the first word, you can have the last as well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's a pr great privilege. Um, I would say that uh, we need to realize that humankind, despite all the sophistication of our so-called modern societies, is still remaining dependent on things that were already important a few million years ago at the beginning of humanity. That is clean and plentiful of water, fertile soils, abundant energy and abundant minerals. So uh, I believe that water, soils, biodiversity, minerals, energy should not uh, further be considered as tradable goods in the sense of uh, other tradable goods. They are essential assets to humanity 
and we need to find ways and means, sounds very utopic, uh, to manage them jointly. We have only one planet to go. We are going to be nine billion competing for access to these resources. This can be extremely destructive. So we have to avoid that very dangerous trap. We have to educate young people and citizens about minerals and metals. What are they? Where are they coming from? How are they produced? Uh, there is very few understanding among the citizens and very limited interest up to recently for these issues. But they are very important because all of us, we can only make decisions. We can only put pressure on politicians if we understand these issues. Um, we need to eco to develop the eco certification of supply chains. There are mining companies, metallurgical companies, who are certified according to ISO 14001, who report according to the Global Reporting Initiative, that is a way to report sustainable performance uh, in a verifiable mode. Uh, these companies need to be well identified, and these procedures can build uh, elements uh, to develop such eco-certification supply chain. Because the matter is not how much minerals are we extracting from nature, but the issue is what is the environmental and social impact of that extraction. If we know how to take out from the planet 10 billion tons of iron ore per year, what's the matter? The matter is we shouldn't at the same time destroy fertile soils, destroy bio biodiversity, uh, destroy uh, groundwater resources and so on. So that is my point of view. We need to develop this eco-certification of mineral supply chains. Thank you. Okay, so thanks to our speakers, uh, Patrice Christman, Paul Ancier, Richard Harrington, Patrick Desmond and Louis von Bota. There's one more person who needs thanks as well. That's Nick Arndt who organized this session. Nick's down the, down the front here. Thank you and thank you for coming. <laughs>